Hi, I'm Heather and I'm going to be speaking about the conflict between accessibility and ethics in the sharing economy. Um, it's really great to be here, particularly given the time we're having back in the UK today. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this talk is going to be quite UK focused. It, should still make sense, but uh, I'm sorry if there are any fellow Brits here. There is no escape. Britain will follow you. Um, so I've got two points to address before we get started. Firstly, what the heck actually is the sharing economy? Um, so the sharing economy was added to the Oxford English Dictionary last year, where it was defined as an economic system in which assets or services are shared between private individuals, either free or for a fee, typically by means of the internet. So, in reality, what we call the sharing economy has existed for centuries, but it's only in recent years with the rise of smartphones and the subsequent explosion in the amount of data available for services to use that companies have begun to devote themselves to exploiting it. Um, the biggest names in the industry are Airbnb and Uber, who you'll be hearing a lot of in this talk, but hundreds of startups launch every year. Um, the second point is, who the heck am I? Uh, this is me, looking really gay in front of Niagara Falls. Um, I'm a trainee developer at Founders and Coders in London, and I also write about comics at panels.net, if that's your jam. And I'm also a disabled woman. I have depression, anxiety, and a cognitive disorder called prosopagnosia that affects a whole bunch of stuff from my ability to recognize and memorize faces uh, to being able to orient myself. So finding this building today was super fun. Um, like a lot of disabled people, my disabilities can cause quite a few difficulties in my day-to-day -day life. Um, so, for instance, good food, and I showed this side to my girlfriend, she was like, what's wrong with this bear? The bear is hungry, okay? The bear is hungry. Um, good food improves my mental health so much, but if I'm having a bad time with my depression, I'll often not have enough energy to cook. Uh, hey, but it's okay. Deliveroo is going to come and deliver food from all my favorite restaurants straight to my flat. Um, I also have anxiety, and as someone with anxiety, I find traveling really hard, especially to places where there's a language barrier. Um, hostels can leave me feeling particularly unsafe, but being on a low income, they're often my only affordable option. But wait! Airbnb! Now with Airbnb, I can afford to have my own space and have direct contact with someone I know speaks the local language and knows the local area, potentially months before I arrive in the area. My prosopagnosia also means that I have a lot of difficulty following maps and can even get lost in areas I know well. How am I meant to get anywhere? Uber, Uber's here to send me a car. I don't even need to know where I am as long as my phone's GPS is working. So. I got all these problems, but the sharing economy is here to fix them. So I've got no more problems, and everything is great. <laughs> and it's not just me that the sharing economy can help. If you experience chronic pain, for instance, Urban Massage can send a masseuse straight to your home. Uh, if cleaning your house would leave you exhausted for the rest of the week, Hassle can send you a cleaner. TaskRabbit and Handy can help you with moving, DIY, grocery shopping, organizing doctor's appointments, pretty much everything. So, the sharing economy. These companies may not have launched with the goal of helping disabled people, but we're sure benefiting from their services. So, everything's great, right? Uh-oh. Because, as our good friend Sonic the Hedgehog says, there is no such thing as ethical consumption under capitalism. <laughs> And the sharing economy can be particularly bad because the speed at which it's exploded across the world has enabled its biggest names to dodge regulation, exploit workers, particularly those from marginalized backgrounds, and destroy communities. Um, so by taking rental properties off the market, Airbnb is pushing up rents around the world and leading to the destruction of poor, largely black and immigrant communities. They turn a blind eye both to discrimination by hosts on the service and the listing of illegal settlements on the West Bank. Uber's business model relies on flouting employment, taxi cab and safety legislation to hire drivers without proper screening and undercut existing taxi firms by slashing wages. 
BuzzFeed, for instance, recently leaked data suggesting that Uber drivers in Detroit earned less than $9 an hour after expenses. And this was in late 2015, before this year's price cuts, after which drivers across the US have reported earning as little as $3 an hour. And that's besides the predatory subprime loans the company offers its drivers to lease a car. Um, Less has been written about Deliveroo because it hasn't launched in the US, but a friend of mine recently leaked the contract you have to sign as a delivery driver. And this may be quite hard to read, but uh, the salient points are that your agreed fee is £6 an hour, which is under the minimum wage in the UK. And they even reserve the right to rescind that uh, and only pay you an unknown fee for each delivery you complete. So let's say you're not a big fan of not being paid the minimum wage and you wanted to take delivery to court. Well, sucks to be you because you're not a worker within the meaning of any employment rights legislation. Uh, and then even then, if it was proven in court that you are a delivery employee, you have to pay any cost del delivery incurs in fighting your legal challenge. Um, and then besides the exploitation of workers and communities, even the benefits of the share economy are only available to a relatively small proportion of the disabled community. Um, it has to be those with the right access requirements. Uber, for instance, recently launched a wheelchair-friendly service in London. But you want to travel in an Uber with a wheelchair anywhere else in the country? You're stuck. Uh, it has to be those with the disposable income to be able to afford these services. Urban massage, for instance, starts at £65 for a 60-minute massage, which, you know, if, like a friend of mine, your chronic pain means that you can't hold down a full-time job, you can't afford that. Um, it's also only those in urban centres. Hassle, for instance, is only available in seven cities in the UK. Um, but even if you live in a big city, access can be limited geographically. A University of Minnesota study found that TaskRabbit workers in Chicago tended to avoid choosing jobs in areas with a low socioeconomic status and charged more when they did, making these services more expensive and less accessible. So, we clearly need to be criticising the sharing economy. But we also need to be considering the value of these services to their disabled users. Because if we don't, we end up in a situation we saw a few months ago with the Whole Foods pre-peeled mandarins con controversy, which isn't a sentence I thought I'd be saying on stage anytime soon. Um, so a few months ago, someone on Twitter spotted these pre-peeled mandarins in their local Whole Foods shop and tweeted about how ridiculous they were. The tweet blew up, leading to outrage over Whole Foods content for their customers, the environment, and who knows what else. In response, Whole Foods issued an apology and pulled the product. But when disability activists rightly pointed out that peeling fruit can be impossible for those with dexterity issues, making pre-prepared fruit a lifeline, they got this kind of response. Uh, you've survived this long without them and you will continue to do so. Um, so, how can we fight back against the ethical failings of the sharing economy without alienating the disabled folk who increasingly on, rely on its services? And I make no apologies for using a corgi here as a representative of the disabled community because look at the little guy. <laughs> he is so cute. Um, so, firstly, we need to be supporting the workers who are being exploited by the sharing economy. Don't cross picket lines. Push for the legal loopholes companies like Uber and Airbnb use to be closed and for further legal protections. Support industrial action and unionisation. In my home county, for instance, a group of around 400 private hire drivers have left Uber to set up a driver's cooperative instead, which is awesome. We need to be protesting cuts to disability services and benefits. The services that the share economy provides, food delivery, transport, household help, these should be accessible to all those who need them, not just those who can afford it. We're already seeing in America the extent to which the sharing economy can replace services that should be free or income adjusted. It's not uncommon in the States to hire an Uber now in medical emergencies because it's cheaper than the cost to call an ambulance. We need to be out in the streets before we potentially end up in the same position. If you're not disabled, you need to be considering disabled people and our accessibility needs in your criticism. The Whole Foods example shows how even completely well-meant criticism can result in ableist attacks and disabled people losing out. And finally, 
we need to be listening. We need to be listening to disabled people, to the workers that deliver the food and drive the cars and build the apps. We even need to be listening to the companies themselves because there aren't any easy answers here. And above all, this is going to have to be a conversation. Um, I've been Heather. This has been Accessibility versus Ethics in the Sharing Economy. I have five minutes left, so if anyone has any questions, 